Today on Quadriga, dangerous war games, Iran on the brink. Tensions between Iran and the West over Tehran's nuclear program are escalating. The Islamic Republic is stepping up military drills and reportedly threatening to launch a preemptive strike against any nation that crosses it. The U.S. and Israel have also been rattling their sabers, refusing to rule out military action against Iran if it fails to curtail its nuclear facilities. And the International Atomic Energy Agency has declared its recent mission a failure. Optimists say a diplomatic solution is still possible, but critics fear the point of no return may have been passed. Your host today is Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Has the point of no return already been reached in Iran, or is there still time left for diplomacy to succeed? These are some of the questions we will address today, along with my three guests. Michael Stürmer is the chief correspondent at the German national daily newspaper Die Welt. Previously, he was the director of the government think tank for strategic affairs. Andrew B. Dennison, the American political scientist, is the director of the think tank Transatlantic Networks. And Ali Fatollah Nejad, an Iranian-German political scientist and a researcher at the University of London. Thank you all for being here. Michael Stürmer, if we were in a court of law, I'd say it is Iran's words against that of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Iran, of course, is saying that it is enriching uranium for peaceful purposes, whereas the IAEA uh, insists that at the end of the day, Iran, it has credible evidence that Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon. Whom to believe? Well, clearly, the international organization in Vienna, the IAEA, uh, gets more credit than uh, the Iranian regime um, because there are obvious glaring contradictions. First of all, uh, the, missile, the Iranian missile program is clearly uh, directed uh, towards uh, nuclear warheads, no question, because otherwise these uh, things fly and detonate somewhere in the desert. Uh, you can only, uh, it makes sense only with nuclear weapons. Second, the, the, the domestic policies of the Iranian regime, the repetition to wipe out Israel at one stroke, I mean, that is clearly an indication of uh, evil intent. Uh, so far, probably the regime doesn't yet have functional uh, functioning uh, nuclear weapons, but they are en route, and if they are not being stopped or stopped themselves, there's still time to stop. Then the world is in for a very, very dangerous uh, fall. Andrew Dennison, how clear is the evidence, though? How reliable is the evidence? I mean, we do uh, all vividly remember the, the disaster we had over the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And even the di director of national intelligence, James Clapper, in the U.S. is saying, we do not know if Iran will eventually decide to build nuclear weapons. Indeed, this is correct. It is uncertain what Iran really intends to do. It's a bit of a riddle as to why the Tehran government behaves as it does. But we clearly see a refusal on the part of the Tehran government to meet its international obligations to allow its nuclear facilities to be inspected, to in establish safeguards so that there's transparency so we can see what they're doing. Because there is clearly a possibility that enriched uranium can also be used for warheads. I don't think they've made a decision yet. And indeed, I would say we're less on the brink of war than in a period of increasing political pressure on both sides. Now, military options in the sense of, of, of what you can do and what the other guy could do against it, or lack of military options, uh, if we couldn't do anything, that would also be a problem. They're part of the equation, but this is about political pressure. And I think that Iran can play its hand with its nuclear technology programs without committing to a nuclear warhead and still see itself as perhaps gaining concessions from the West if it would cease and desist. Ali Fatullah Nejad, of course, the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, has said over and over again that Iran is not seeking nuclear weapons, that, it might be, that such a move might even be un-Islamic. Um, but 
if Iran were to pursue nuclear weapons, why would that be the case? Give us a reasoning behind the motivation. I mean, if you look at the past 10 years, you see that there has been, I mean, actually since the Iranian revolution, there is a sense of insecurity in Tehran. And in the last 10 years, the situation has worsened and Iran is basically encircled by uh, U.S. military bases all over the region. Both its neighbors to the west and to the east, Iraq and Afghanistan, have been occupied by the Americans, which is seen uh, from Tehran's point of view as an, as an arch enemy. And there have been uh, threats from uh, emanating from both Israel and Washington, especially during the Bush administration, to wage uh, some kind of a preemptive uh, strike against Iran. So uh, we have to acknowledge that there is a sense of insecurity in Tehran, uh, which might fuel uh, the thinking in some circles there that uh, there is a rationale to have a nuclear weapons capability. That is, to have uh, some kind of you know, to be able to build a nuclear weapon within a short period of time. But uh, we have inspections from the International Atomic Energy Agency. We have 24-7 cameras and so forth. So Iran, in current state, cannot go and nuclearize. What is very important here is the strategic uh, dimension of it. In fact, uh, there is, why would, in Iran, why would a nuclear weapon be in Iran's interest? We have to really think about this issue because what happens when someone on the Arabian Peninsula nuclearizes? What about the geopolitical weight and influence that Iran naturally has because of its geographic position? It would lose it. So there is, we have to understand in the Western capitals as well that there is a, some kind of a important strategic debate going on in Tehran, which is not uh, going, you know, which is not hell bent on getting nuclear weapons, but which is just uh, having, uh, you know, uh, which is insisting on having uh, the, you know, the, the nuclear program. And so there is no real strategic intent for now to build a nuclear weapon. And this has been said by, uh, the, uh, by the chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States very recently, that there is no decision to go, to, uh, to go for a nuclear weapon in Tehran. And this is what we have to repeat. Well, let's look at the status quo of Iran's nuclear program. As you all mentioned, inspectors were just recently in, in Iran. And uh, let's see what, if anything, they came up with. Yeah. Iran's nuclear program was originally set up with the support of the United States and Europe. It includes research sites, uranium mines, and uranium enrichment facilities. So far, there's just one operating nuclear power plant, built with Russian help at Boucher near the Gulf Coast. But more are planned. The West has long alleged that Iran also has a second secret program developing nuclear weapons. The IAEA has repeatedly sent inspectors to try to verify those claims, but Iran has hindered their efforts. During their most recent visit, inspectors requested access to the site at Parchin near Tehran, but Iran refused. So we approached this trip uh, in, a very, in a constructive uh, spirit. Uh, unfortunately, we could not get agreement uh, on either of them. So we could not get access, we could not uh, uh, finalize uh, a way forward. Western intelligence agencies say Iran has already developed all the technologies necessary for the building of a nuclear weapon. That means even if Tehran doesn't have the bomb right now, it could quickly produce one if it wanted to. Well, Michael Stürmer, we just saw the inspectors came up empty-handed. They left Iran without any results. Has Iran, has Tehran squandered another good opportunity? I think they have, yes, and uh, the, the, the Tehran regime or those who are uh, the leaders in the nuclear matter seem to believe something mythological, that they are, once they are close to nuclear weapons or once they have nuclear weapons, um, they are invulnerable. Now this is far from being the case, uh, the, the great concern is of course that even at the present moment, where Iran most likely does not yet have the bomb, um, even at this present moment, the whole geography of power in the Middle East is changing simply because if your neighbor acquires nuclear weapons or is seen as acquiring nuclear weapons, whatever the reality, 
you feel very uncomfortable. And one way to respond is that you go nuclear yourself. So the idea is five years, ten years from now, that we have a fully nuclearized Middle East, which is utterly, utterly unstable. We had nuclear deterrence, deterrence and defense during the Cold War, but it was a bipolar system. There's no idea that once Iran is close or has nuclear weapons, that not Egypt, Saudi Arabia, lots of countries, including Turkey, would not think very hard about going nuclear themselves. So the genie is almost out of the bottle. And the non-proliferation non treaty is not being taken seriously enough in many cases, has not been. Now it is slowly, but it, it may already be too late. Now it is slowly being taken. The non-proliferation treaty that is five legitimate nuclear powers plus many others who are allowed civilian, like Iran, civilian uh, nuclear power uh, and uh, under controls, under safeguards from the Vienna Authority. This is as far as international law can go in an existential question. But Andrew Dennison, of course, to speak, speaking of the NPT, um, isn't it true that there might be a double standard? Because at the end of the day, of course, it is widely believed that Israel has nuclear weapons. It is not signatory to the NPT. Um, but isn't that a contradiction to the wish of a nuclear-free Middle East? Well, you could say there's a double standard, although I would argue that to maintain because Israel has nuclear weapons, everyone should have nuclear weapons, would be the wrong way to go. It's true, Israel has nuclear weapons. Now, I have less of a concern with nuclear weapons than with the government that controls them. You know, I come from Wyoming, and even in Wyoming, cowboy country, not everyone is allowed to carry a gun. We do not give criminals the right to carry a gun, or children. So I think that we also have to look at the nature of the Iran government. That government, with its track record, not only on nuclear technology, and it does refuse safeguards. We are not in a situation now where Iran is in compliance with the safeguard agreements of the, of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Okay? They are in violation. That is clear. But it is also a question of Iran's terrorism or support for terrorism abroad, from the Kobar Towers that were bombed in Saudi Arabia in the 90s to the role of Iran in supporting the Mahdi militia in Iraq with explosively formed projectiles, also killing American soldiers, the role of Iran in supporting Hezbollah uh, in, in Lebanon, uh, a state within a state with uh, long-range missiles that could strike Israel, the role of Iran in supporting Hamas, the role of Iran in trying to, I must say, in a very amateur way, trying to, um, at least we think, trying to kill Israeli diplomats in the last couple of weeks. So there are a lot of things that concern us about Iran that make us think that government should not be trusted with a nuclear weapon, or even the technology that might give them a nuclear weapon a number of years down the road. Would you, would you then say, or doubt rather, that uh, the Iranian political elite are not rational actors? Well, they may be rational actors in the face of all the contradictions of their political order. 80 million people, a huge modern society, ruled by a bunch of geriatric theologists who claim their power comes from God. I doubt that. I think their power comes because they're power hungry. But Iran um, has the potential to change, I think, to enter the modern world of limited government, of a free press, separation between church and state. And that, Iran, I would have no problem with them enriching uranium. Oh, no, I don't have that much problem with India enriching uranium. It's a different kind of government. But now, it's a big problem, as are the other things. Human rights, finally. We should say, you know, there's an American that's on death row in Iran right now, accused of spying. Hundreds of people are on death row. The opposition movement that grew up a couple of years ago, many of those people were tortured and murdered. So we have a problem with the form of government. But I think at the end of the day, uh, the 
form of government they have is not sustainable. It will fall. Well, Ali Fatola Nejad, let's speak of the Iranian government at the end of the day, and let's look at domestic politics. Of course, an important parliamentary elections are coming up in Iran. It's going to be the first important nationwide election after the disputed 2009 elections, uh, which, which spurred the green movements. Um, is the standoff over its nuclear program perhaps just a way for the Iranian government to distract from its internal problems? Well, I think, I mean, for all sides involved, this has been a game that has been played during the last 10 years, and there are certainly factions from all sides who do benefit from this dangerous game. But on a, bro on a broader point, I think that we ha I'm, really, I'm really puzzled over the assumptions that I've been hearing so far, because we keep repeating all the assumptions for, uh, I mean, that we have done so for the last 10 years, both in, in strategic terms, and I've, uh, I've mentioned one uh, important strategic element that is not really saying that Iran is hell-bent on acquiring nuclear weapons. And secondly, in terms of our political assessment, if we talk about uh, you know, the evil nature of the Iranian regime, I, I just wonder what, uh, what kind of, you know, uh, kindred soul our uh, allies in Saudi Arabia have. So we, we are dealing with, I mean, we should do away with such double standard talk. Why so? Because if we do not do so, we cannot make rational decisions ourselves in dealing with Iran. We have to see the strategic dimension of the Iran problem. And the strategic dimension pertains to the issue of security. And this is why we have to do something about alleviating this sense of insecurity. And, uh, and of course, we have to deal with uh, also Israel, because Israel has nuclear weapons. And this is something that worries not only Iran, but also other countries. So if we talk about international law, we should talk about also other cases which are relevant wow. to the Iranian case. So I don't think that we can make rational choices ourselves by uh, going along with such, you know, such uh, hyped up uh, alarmist views. And I think what I'm saying now is very much understood in Washington. And um, it is not so much understood in, in, in Israel. And in Europe, we have uh, both, uh, you know, two camps, basically, one hawkish camp and one more pragmatist camp. But we have to really rethink our policies towards Iran, because in diplomatic studies, as some of you might know, what do we call our approach towards Iran? We call it coercive diplomacy. It's a kind of coercion that we have you know, used from day one. And for me, it is no surprise at all that the, that the strategy, strategy has failed. You cannot coerce a country into a sense of security, and you cannot coerce a country to respond to your demands in a positive way, this is, this is not going to work. So what we need instead is to go for serious diplomacy. And serious diplomacy has to work out. We have never tried serious diplomacy with Iran. And this is something we have to think about. Well, with because respect, first of all, there are double standards. If you sign up to the non-proliferation treaty, you sign up to double standards. There are nuclear powers, legitimate nuclear powers. There are non-nuclear powers, and then there are those who do not sign up. Israel, India, Pakistan have never signed up to the non-proliferation treaty. So when we talk about international laws, we talk about the non-proliferation treaty. Iran is part of the non-proliferation treaty, has benefited on end. Bushir started as a German project in Iran, and then 19 comes the Ayatollah, it was cut off, and then the Russians took over. All this is perfectly legitimate. What is not legitimate is that all the controls, all the safeguards that are a condition of international cooperation in nuclear matters have been disregarded. Have, uh, and that's exactly where the point of international law is very valid. And behind international law, there is, of course, the great concern uh, about a country whose leaders openly say we want to erase Israel from the maps of the earth. I mean, you know that uh, half a dozen of ex-diplomats to Tehran, Western ex-diplomats, issued a letter or uh, wrote an article just a few weeks ago, which was published in Germany by the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And they stated the case that you, there is no evidence for Iran having broken the international law in terms of pursuing its nuclear program. So we have to be very careful in assessing it. We, we cannot do the same mistake in analyzing Iraq, uh, Iran that we did in the case of Iraq. And I see a deja vu here. So we should be careful 
in not overstating the case. Because if we do so, you say, oh, it's an existential threat and it's so huge, so the risk of inaction is so huge, as, uh, so we cannot risk to do nothing. So we have to do something. And this is something, a very dangerous kind of thinking that we should uh, avoid, not avoid by wishful thinking on our side, but very sound and sober analysis of the situation on the ground. And I'm hopeful that there are circles that are doing this. Well, look, the situation on the ground, that's exactly why you sent in inspectors. And that's because the inspectors were blocked. And that's why they went back to Vienna after two days of, completely, of a complete waste of time. So I, but I but don't you know really that, follow your argument. There these, are no serious inspections. But well, let me interfere here just for a brief second, because you mentioned that there is no, no genuine efforts to engage in diplomacy. Um, well, let's look at the diplomatic initiatives out there that have so far been undertaken. Officially, at least, the international community hopes that Tehran can be brought into line without military force. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon continues to call for a peaceful resolution to the crisis. All these issues should be resolved peacefully uh, through negotiation, through dialogue. But the European Union has already moved beyond talk. It's announced an oil embargo toughening the existing sanctions regime. Other economic measures, such as banking restrictions, are likely to follow. But Iran remains defiant, preempting the European ban by announcing it will not export oil. Tehran insists it has no nuclear weapons program, but its failure to cooperate fully with the IAEA means the six-party talks which broke down 13 months ago are unlikely to be resumed. And Iran's support within the UN Security Council is waning. Well, Andrew Dennison, would you say that uh, the West is focusing too much on sanctions as a tool as far as uh, diplomacy is concerned? Do you think that negotiations are seen as perhaps a form of appeasement even? No, negotiations are not a form of appeasement. They are a form of political pressure. And coercive diplomacy at this point vis-a-vis -vis Iran is exactly what we need. And to an extent that economic sanctions are invoked, it perhaps delays the day when we might reach to military force, but it certainly in helps. It helps to put pressure on to the Iranian regime. And if Iran would behave in a similar way as Germany does, then there would be less need for coercive diplomacy. But our problem is that Iran is very interested in coercive diplomacy, and that's why it's developing a nuclear program and long-range missiles. That's why it's funding a wide range of militias around the Middle East, and that is why it continues to make political threats. I would love it to, I would be very happy to sign a non-aggression treaty with Iran, and Iran would say, or we would say we will no longer attack Iran or even threaten them, and Iran would publicly state we will no longer threaten or attack Israel, we will respect the sovereignty of Lebanon and no longer support Hezbollah, and we will respect the sovereignty of Iraq, and we will no longer support the Shiite militias in Iraq against the central government, and we will also no longer harbor al-Qaeda, because as an article recently in the New York Times stated, Iran still sees al-Qaeda as the enemy of their enemy, and still carries out deals with them. So it seems to me that the, um, the double standard is really Iran. You know, and another point I should bring up, Saudi Arabia and Iran are not the same situation. Iran is our enemy and claims that they don't like us and want us to leave and they want to destroy Israel. Saudi Arabia at least claims to be our friend. We don't like how Saudi Arabia treats women. That is, we Americans, we Europeans. Hillary Clinton doesn't like it, but she knows she has more influence in Saudi Arabia through peaceful means. We have at least a conversation going on in Saudi Arabia. If we could have that conversation with Iran, we would be much farther, and the danger of war would be much less. But it is also Iran that keeps rattling the saber. All that said, we should not forget that in this period of pressure, we have seen Iran offer a concession. Lady Ashton and Hillary Clinton just last week spoke about the letter from Dr. Al-Arabi from Iran saying they were willing to negotiate with the P5 in the P51 framework 
that is the permanent five members of the Security Council plus Germany. They were willing to negotiate in that framework on nuclear matters and with no conditions. Both of those points, on nuclear matters and with no conditions, were recognized by Hillary Clinton and Lady Ashton as a significant concession on the part of Iran. So I would argue that the pressure of the economic sanctions and the political isolation of Iran and the instability in Syria is making Iran think twice about a policy of confrontation. Well, Ali Fatola and Nejad, both Michael Stürmer and Andrew B. Dennison are basically saying Iran cannot be trusted. Iran is not a player out there whose, whose words can be, can be trusted. Um, what would Tehran need to do to establish that trust within the international community? I think, I mean, in, in, I mean, first of all, we have to be clear that if you analyze Iranian foreign policy, especially uh, very recently, quite recently, you see that Iranian foreign policy is pragmatic. And this is kind of a consensus among those people who are, cons I mean, uh, studying the matter. So this is for one, one side. Secondly, I do not believe, of course, that the coercive diplomacy against Iran has worked. And I think today hardly anyone does so. And this is why we have to rethink our strategy and we have to abandon this kind of coercive approach towards uh, Iran and we have to go for serious negotiations. That said, also all sides have to do their, their, uh, their part, to play their part. So that is, uh, the Iranians can engage in confidence building measures. The Iranians ha have in fact said that they're willing to sign the additional protocol to the non-proliferation treaty to the NPT, which allows for snap inspections of Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, once sanctions are removed, and also the sanctions policy has been an utter failure. What have we accomplished I been with sanctions? I think because you can you, look at the if, if consumer in Iran. Ni there are 9,000 centrifuges suffering. spinning in Iran today. Yes. And I do not understand how w one can possibly say that this has been a success. I no, think it has the letter from, from Al Arabi from a Western was a success. Point of view. And I also think that, uh, that Iran hasn't been negotiating seriously. Indeed, I would say that if you look at the consensus that has been built between Europe and the United States, and also in the UN Security Council with resolutions supported by China and Russia to put pressure on Iran that we have had a successful strategy and I also remind you it's not just based on coercion. Lady Ashton and Hillary Clinton spoke clearly of a twin track strategy and there are offers on the table to the Iranians that we will supply them very quickly with spare parts for their airplanes that are falling apart with assistance in their petroleum refining capabilities with a number of other serious carrots that are on the table. But they then need to negotiate seriously, which means allowing a safeguarding of their nuclear facilities. Just briefly, Michael Schimmel, I'll be right with you. Just to say that sanctions, of course, can only be one tool and a preliminary one at that. But of course, a war of words are heating up, both between Iran and Israel. Let's have a look. A show of strength by Iran. These exercises demonstrate Iran's resolve that it's not about to back down over the nuclear issue. Tehran accuses the West of trying to provoke conflict. As the enemy threatens us, we want to show our power and show that we, Islamic Iran, are the guards of the security of the region. Yet fears over security in the region are growing. The U.S. has made a point of sailing through a key shipping lane in the region that Iran has threatened to close. And Israel, after attacks on its diplomats in India and Georgia, is also ratcheting up the rhetoric. Just uh, imagine if this is what Iran allows itself to do whilst it doesn't have at the moment of nuclear capabilities, what kind of Iran will it be? And what will it dare to do once they have nuclear capabilities? Some commentators say Iran may be flexing its muscle, but it's also trying to promote dialogue. Whatever the case, the situation remains unpredictable. Well, Michael Stürmer, the situation, as we heard, remains unpredictable. Netanyahu, of course, has said numerous times that Israel will not hesitate to strike. But there are some U.S. military analysts who are saying that Israel doesn't have the military capacity to carry off such a huge and highly complex operation. So is it just saber-rattling on the part of Israel? 
Well, it would go to the utter limits of Israel's technical capability. Um, but also this, what you call saber rattling, is of course stepping up deterrence. Um, that is part of the game. But we have a very real chance to see a strike, a major strike in the Middle East before the end of the year, probably before the American elections. And I see that on the uh, Iranian side, uh, the situation is hardening. Uh, otherwise, the Iranians so far were great in procrastination. To negotiate with Iranians is, for Westerners, a torture because you are moving in circles all the time. It's procrastination and you are not getting anywhere. Uh, you cannot nail a pudding against the, the wall and it is a very evil smelling pudding here we are talking about. Um, is the situation serious? Yes, it is very serious. Has the Iranian regime uh, shown that it reacts? Yes, it does react. Uh, it now feels squeezed and uh, American pressure, Israeli pressure, European pressure, including from Germany, are very serious indeed. And uh, all the arguments that I have heard do not convince me. Why does the Iranian regime, which has enormous problems at home, vast inflation, vast unemployment, a lost generation, why on earth do they go for nuclear weapons uh, instead of taking up the offers that come from the West, including from this country, and see that Iran modernizes as a modern industrial country uh, and keeps create and, and does create jobs, jobs, jobs. Iran is in a desperate situation. The Iranian young generation or several young generations are in a desperate situation. Sacrifice all this for the pipe dream of nuclear weapons? But I mean, it seemed to me that two motives exist for Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons. And the first is the political power that comes domestically from saying we are a nation that determine our own fate, and if we want to build nuclear weapons, Israel has them, we can. And there is an argument that there is support, even among the opposition to the current government, for a nuclear program. The second reason is probably that the leaders of Iran realize they are in a very desperate situation, and their long-term survival is by no means guaranteed. And they probably think in the back of their head, if they had a nuclear deterrent, they might be able to avoid Gaddafi's fate. That said, Israel's saber rattling, the talk of Israel about to strike, I think, again, has less to do with the prospect of war in the near future than of the diplomatic dance that's going on. Because if Israel says we're about to attack, the consensus in Europe and the United States that we better look for an alternative like stronger economic sanctions goes up. Sure. However, if Israel rattles the saber too much, then we read an article like from Elizabeth Bowmiller in the New York Times this Sunday that says Israel would not be able to destroy the nuclear facilities of Iran. Now, some Americans say, oh boy, we better give them some weapons, because as long as we have that card in our hand, the Israel threat, we can put pressure on Iran. But I don't think anyone in America or Europe wants the military option. We're not going to take it off the table, but the best military option is the one that's never used, that causes Iran, under all of this pressure, to make concessions. And I do think, again, the situation in Syria also puts pressure on Iran to make concessions. Now. Well, you just said that the U.S. does not want Israel to strike at this point. Uh, right. The Joint Chiefs of Staff has already made it rather clear that he would find such a situation destabilizing. But is it conceivable that Israel would strike Iran without the approval and consent of the U.S.? I seriously, seriously doubt it. We were able to get Israel to refrain from attacking Iraq in, in 1991 when Iraq was shooting Scud missiles onto Israel. I think in this situation, too, we would be able to get Israel to refrain. However, if, if there was an existential threat, if for some reason um, hundreds of Israeli civilians were killed by a, a Hezbollah bomb that was traced right back to Tehran, then they might not attack the nuclear facilities, but Israel could also destroy the, or damage seriously, seriously the Iranian Navy 
that is a threat to the Strait of Hormuz. Ali Fatullah just briefly, uh, go back to Iran uh, for me for a second here. Does all the rhetoric, all the harsh rhetoric on the part of Israel and also partially uh, the United States, does it perhaps have the potential to turn the nation even more nationalistic in the sense that even opponents of Ahmadinejad might be inclined to rally around this government? Uh, without any doubt, especially what we're seeing these uh, these past weeks, because you, you, uh, Mr. Stimme has has talked about uh, the plight of the Iranian in, in terms of the economic condition of the country, but what we're doing now, we're waging an economic war on the Iranian economy. So we have crippling sanctions against Iran, from which every Iranian citizen in Iran and outside Iran now currently suffers. So I think it's highly problematic to talk about all our you know, good intentions of Iran, Iran civil society to develop, and at the same time to cripple the Iranian economy, which is at least the basis for any uh, you know, any uh, strong middle class and uh, you know, uh, the, the very basis of any uh, democracy and at the same time threaten the country with war that is only going to foster heartliners from all sides. So I think this is a utterly counterproductive policy that we have pursued so far. So as a bigger player in this game, and, we're on, and there is no doubt that the West is the bigger player here, we should be we should not always you know, look to the Iranians and say, yeah, you, you should do this and that, and you should do this, this and that. We should to critically reassess our policies, and this is high time to do so. If not, we are heading towards a disastrous war with calamitous, with calamitous consequences, not only regionally, but also globally. And well, this I think is we reassess our policies daily and in a very sophisticated form, and I do think there is an earnest and serious effort to find any possible way of coming to an agreement with Iran, because we would all benefit from that. You, you but let me also important. say, you I, I agree with the, the non-aggression treaty, which be amazingly important. That what you mentioned mm -hmm. before, the, a, a kind of non-aggression agreement. Yes, we should do really do that, and we should make clear that we are not, you know, intent on. Uh, uh, on, on, on bombing another country, and they, uh, they should also not do anything aggressive towards us. And I think it's so, going to be much harder for not we should go for. To... And at the same time, this is what you mentioned before: mm -hmm. a time of. It's also time to think about a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. And you know that the first United Nations Middle East Free of Weapons of Mass Destruction Zone conference is going to be held sometime soon in Finland. And I think there needs to be some strong signals from the West that the only issue, the only way to tackle this security dilemma issue problem in the Middle East effectively is to have regional disarmament. And we should do so. Why not? Yeah, but Israel cannot disarm when Iran is making those kind of threats but, but then and developing not, uh, those kind of then solving the problem. No, you, no, you're not solving the problem by saying we disarm first and hope Iran follows. That does not work. Okay, Iran is we're under not inspections. going to do that. Now, one other. No, Iran is not under inspections. Iran refuses to comply with inspections. And another point that I want to make clear: Yes, economic sanctions are a blunt instrument. They put off perhaps war, but they're a blunt instrument. They help the government in power. Look how Saddam Hussein and his black market profiteers benefited from sanctions. Nevertheless, they also put pressure on the government. And I think we should ask, what is the opposition in Iran saying about economic sanctions? And Many of them think that, yes, we will pay. Gasoline will no longer be available. But if you can topple the government with these economic sanctions, it might be a price worth paying. So I think you cannot reject economic sanctions, especially when people in Iran are also interested in putting pressure on the Tehran government. I think, I mean, there is hardly any support from the Iranian opposition to have crippling sanctions. Because if you look at the literature and also the past evidence of economic sanctions, you yeah. see that they are actually increasing mm -hmm. the pressure on the whole civilian population. This has been the case in Iraq. Sure. The whole fabric of society has been destroyed before Iraq was invaded in 2003. So what I fear now, the crippling sanctions are only a precursor to war. Although we should say that the sanctions that are being applied are not associated with the word crippling, but targeted. And the sanctions are primarily at the leadership elite and their money, and not so much, because we all know if we hurt anymore. the middle class, Which we hurt the them. Case. I'm sorry, I want to bring in Michael Stürmer here for a second. Yeah, uh, I want to mention something that has been completely ignored by us so far, and that is the danger 
of military action on the part of the United States when Iran gets serious about blocking the Straits of Hormuz. For the Americans, this is uh, an absolute unacceptable policy. So uh, it, it tends to be ignored, but that is a conditioned reflex on the part of the US to open up blocked sea lanes. It's, it's a kind of genetic uh, response that would come. And that may, if the Iranian regime continues on its path, blocking, threatening to block, holding v live maneuvers in that part of the world, this is not only hitting at oil, the oil supply of the world, but also at this particular American concern. Let me just get a very brief uh, response here from all of you. Quick last round, because we're running out of time. Michael Stürmer, Leon Panetta, Defense Secretary of the U.S., has said that Israel will probably launch a strike by June the latest. How likely is that? Do you think that's a scenario we will see? I would extend the time span to the eve of the American elections. Andrew Dennison. And I'm going to have to say, first, Leon Panetta did not say that. He said some people are talking about that and they see a window of opportunity closing. But we need to make a big difference between Leon Panetta saying Israel is going to strike by June. And I don't think Israel is going to strike before the American election. I think Obama has lots of reasons to not let Israel drive in this very dangerous situation. Ayafatollah Nejad, your assessment? I think we have to do everything to prevent a war which will whose ramifications will be not only regional but also global. It will, it will affect yeah. the national interests of Western countries. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, absolutely calamitous. And we should do our best to re really critically reassess our policies and to rethink if it has been wise to go so, f so far in terms of imposing crippling sanctions on Iran that are counterproductive in terms of conflict resolution as well. So. What is the point of pressuring someone to get security? This is not going to work. There's no alternative. Well, certainly a very unpredictable situation out there, which will remain uh, so in the next few weeks, months to come. Uh, the presidential election in the U.S., of course, we will uh, look out for, and the situation in Iran we will continue to monitor. I want to thank all my three guests for their insights, and I want to thank you all out there for watching, and hope to see you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.